since I'm giving the oath, I'll give you one too. If you would uh, affirm the oath when I complete its reading, uh, do you affirm that the testimony you are about to give to this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I, thank you. We now have um, the Honorable Kimberly J. Muller, uh, Richard Mark Gurgle, uh, Michelle Childs, and Catherine Eagles before us, all uh, distinguished people. And I would like to uh, open the floor uh, to Judge M Muller. Is it Muller or Mueller? It's, it's Mueller. Mueller. Th thank you for asking. All right. And she, as I understand it, uh, it's from the Eastern District of California. Uh, this is a district with a very high caseload. And um, she is nominated for Judge Damrell's seat, who has taken senior status. Um, she has presided over more than 50 trials and seen approximately 230 cases to verdict or judgment. So she is an experienced jurist. And I think what we will do is go right down the line and ask each of you to make a few opening comments and introduce your family, uh, if you will. Uh, so why don't we begin with you, Judge? May I please interrupt? Excuse me for that, uh, Madam Chairman. I've just got notice now that I do have to run, but could I just welcome each of you and apologize for what seems to be a very unfair process here, where you probably will not get the same attention <laughs> that the uh, nominee just before you did. And I want to assure all of the people who have so patiently waited and have come here to see you perform in this stage that the fact that you may not get quite the same attention is a testament to the fact that having looked at all of the stuff in advance, and I shouldn't say stuff, all of the material that you provided in advance, you don't seem to have created anything of sufficient controversy, shall we say, to uh, cause us to have to spend that much time with you. So with your leave, I would like to express my congratulations to all of you. Look forward to um, reading anything that you might say that's controversial. That might be a, a hint. And thank you, Senator Feinstein, for your courtesies oh, at the hearing this morning. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, that means you have Senator Kyle's vote. <laughs> In any event, um, thank you for being here. And I know I speak for the ranking member. He can speak for himself. But we both very much regret this. But it is the way of trying to move a number of judges at one time. So uh, let me begin with you, Judge. Madam Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, Senator Sessions. I would like to first, of course, thank President Obama for the great honor of placing my name in nomination I would like to thank each of you and the committee as a whole for taking me under consideration, considering whether or not to confirm. I would also like to acknowledge family members and friends who are here with me today, if I may. May I ask them to stand briefly as yes, I introduce them? Yes, please do. All right. My parents have joined me here from North Newton, Kansas, Ted and Berniel Mueller. My husband, Robert Johnston Sloby. Please is stand so that we might be yeah. able to see you. Thank you. Ted and Bernil Mueller, Robert Johnston Sloby, my husband from Sacramento. I'm also joined by my sister, Lou Jean Mueller Eilman from West Des Moines, Iowa. Additionally, I'm joined by friends, very good friends from Boston, Massachusetts, Brad and Mary Power, and their daughters, my special friends, Mary and Hannah. Additionally, Dave Jones, D D Dave Smith, a friend from New York City. Andy Stroud, a former colleague at Ora Carrington and Sutcliffe from Sacramento, and Blackwood, a friend from Sacramento who, who is working in Washington, D.C. today. Uh, You're this filling up the room. Uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I risk having left someone out. There, there are some people watching, and it, with your patience, I would just acknowledge them as well. Please. And my family and friends could now be, be seated if they are still standing. Mm -hmm. My sister, Melan, and her husband, Simon Foster, are not able to be here. They are in London, England. My mother-in-law, Carolyn Sloby of Sacramento, is not able to be here. My brother-in-law, Gary Sloby of San Diego. My sister-in-law, Wendy Blakemore of Boulder, Colorado, and her children, Katie, a teacher in Denver, her son, Patrick, a first-year student at Cornell Law School, and finally, our cousin, Stephen James in Sacramento. 
thank you for the opportunity to acknowledge them here today. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Judge Gergel? Thank you, uh, Senator and Ranking Member, for the privilege of being here today. I first would like to thank President Obama for, Obama for the high honor of the nomination. I would like to thank Senator Graham and Senator DeMint for their support for my nomination, and I was quite humbled by the warm comments of Senator Graham and, and uh, Majority Whip Clyburn today at the beginning of the proceeding. Um, I would like, if they could stand, uh, my dear wife of 30 years, Dr. Belinda Gergel, uh, my son, Richie, who's come from New York where he works for NBC News, uh, my son, Joseph, a graduate student in Paris, is watching my streaming video, as is my 88-year-old mother, who was very humbled by her, her youngest son being here today. And my dear friend, Doug Jennings, has come from Bennettsville, South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judge Childs? Yes, Madam Chair Feinstein and Ranking Member Sessions and also other members of the Judiciary Committee who have not had the opportunity to be here before us, thank you. I'm greatly humbled by this opportunity to appear before you. I'd like to express sincere appreciation and gratitude to President Obama for this high honor and privilege of being nominated. And, of course, to our senators who have been here in support, particularly Senator Graham, who also made some very warm comments for us today, and then also the Majority Whip Clyburn. We also express appreciation to Senator DeMint, who's also in support of our nomination. I'd like to acknowledge my family as well. I begin first with my husband, Dr. Floyd Angus. He's a gastroenterologist in Sumter, South Carolina. He also has next to him my mother, Chandra Childs. Uh, my mother is second of 12 children, and I uh, wish to uh, acknowledge my grandmother. He looks like your sister. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bertha Mary Green, who's in Detroit, Michigan, who is the matriarch of the family, not able to be here. My mother's other sibling, my Uncle Derek and Vivian Green, they came here from Atlanta, Georgia. And when you have a family of 12, there's always an older sibling who watches a younger sibling, and that's the pair be uh, relationship between those two. My brother-in-law, Dr. Sherwin Angus, who's an anesthesiologist here in Hampton, Virginia, and my sister, who's watching by web, who's watching my 16-month-old daughter, my heart, Juliana, and her family and uh, her husband and children. I'd like to acknowledge them. Then also here with us as well is my cousin, Victoria Trice, who actually lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and I'd like to say hello to all my Weathers family. There's an original 13 on that side, so I do have a large family <laughs> contingency. You're lucky. And <laughs> thank you. And then also a uh, large family contingency. You're lucky. And <laughs> thank you. And then also uh, yes. thank you all. <laughs> thank you. And I should have said, Madam Chief Justice, in any event, uh, welcome and welcome to your family. Um, Judge Eagles? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Sessions. I also would like to thank the President for the honor, and I am privileged to introduce my family that I have here with me. My husband, I'd ask them to stand. My husband, Bill, is here. My sons, John Ivey and Thad, are here. My mother, Dorothy Caldwell, is here. I'm also joined by some friends who live in the D.C. area, from uh, college friends who are here, Mary Kingsley and Alice Smith, and some friends from the time I spent in D.C. when I was in law school, uh, Susan Kaplan and Paul Collaruli. They are all here with me. Um, my brothers and sisters are scattered around the country, and my nieces and nephews, and they are here in spirit. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, since three of you are already uh, judges, I'd like to ask one question and go right down the line and have you answer it. Um, how can you assure us that in any case that comes before you, you will or that you have been able to disregard your own personal views and allegiances and decide the case only on the law and the facts. Judge Muller. Madam Chairman, thank you for that question. I believe that's a first principle of judging. In fact, I think putting on the black robe symbolizes that exercise of putting aside personal views and coming to the bench, um, coming to the case with the intent of applying only the law as it is given in the Constitution by the Supreme Court, by the Circuit Court in my case, um, applying controlling precedent and doing a judge's best to reach the correct decision under the law. Thank you, Judge. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Gergel. I don't mind that reference. Yeah, I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Madam Chairwoman, the paramount issue in the adjudicative process is the rule of law. There is nothing more fundamental, and I pledge to you 
if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, that that will always be my first and central concern, the paramount nature of the rule of law. Thank you. Madam Chief Justice? Well, actually, that is not my correct title. I'm a circuit court judge, but the reference earlier to Chief Justice was to Chief Justice Toe, who has allowed me to, oh. grat yeah, in her gratitude, to serve as an acting justice on our South Carolina Supreme Court from time to time. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, in reference to your question, I have a high regard and sincere appreciation for our legal system, which is the form of order in our court, in our democracy. I believe that my record supports that I allow litigants to access the courts and have their disputes adjudicated in a fair and impartial manner under a fair and independent legal system. I approach all cases allowing litigants to have equal justice under the law and to act in accordance with the rule of law. Thank you very much. Judge Eagles? Yes, I would uh, join my colleagues here at the table in expressing uh, respect for the rule of law. Part of the role of the judge is to ensure a predictable process, uh, to ensure that the law, as it has been expressed by the, the higher courts, I've been a state court judge for six, almost 17 years. In my case, it would have been the North Carolina Court of Appeals and Supreme, North Carolina Supreme Court uh, has is followed in my courtroom every day as fairly and consistently as I am able to do so. One other question. What is your understanding of the scope of congressional power under Article I of the Constitution, in particular the Commerce Clause, and under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment? Who would like to go first? Judge Mullen? Ma Madam Chairman, I'll, I'll do my best to answer your question, I have not had the opportunity to, to make such a decision. I can tell you if the question is asking about whether or not I would ever rule a statute unconstitutional, I, I can tell you that I would presume a statute to be constitutional and only uh, overturn after very serious consideration and not readily. But generally, my approach to any case would be to look at the question presented, look at the record of the case before me, marshal the applicable law, and apply that law to the specific question presented. I have not made a decision, I believe, that addresses that question to date. Mr. Gergel? Yes, ma'am. Um, obviously, the uh, Commerce Clause provides broad powers to Congress. The presence of the Supreme Court demonstrate that, but that power is not uh, unlimited. The Tenth Amendment is an important feature in balancing the respective powers of the federal and state government. Likewise, our Section 5 of the 14th Amendment provides important remedial powers to Congress to remedy um, violations of equal protection and due process. But again, that power is not unlimited. Thank you. Uh, Judge uh, Childs? I, too, have not had the opportunity to address this particular situation in state court. However, as a limited role in federal court, I would approach only cases and controversies before me. With respect to any laws uh, respecting your congressional uh, powers, I would presume that anything that you all are doing is constitutional and would approach it with that mindset, knowing that you would only enact laws that you have had due deliverance over and consider deliberation over, so I would make that presumption in the first place. There may be a course of action in which we might have to un uh, consider something to be unconstitutional, but I would hope that we'd be in a position where the record, you may not have to read that, reach that decision. But, of course, only those particular facts and circumstances that are before the court would I make decisions about. Thank you. Judge Eagles? Yes, uh, as a state court judge, I have not faced many Commerce Clause issues, and I do know there are some recent cases in that area from the United States Supreme Court. It would be my intention to read those cases carefully, to read Fourth Circuit cases, if there are any that are on point and helpful to the factual situation that would be in front of me, and uh, if there are not, to perhaps look beyond the Fourth Circuit to other circuits if I were fortunate enough to be confirmed, and to apply the law as it is put forward by those appellate courts to the facts specifically in front of me, to only reach constitutional questions when necessary, and to uh, rule narrowly when possible. Thank you. Um, Senator Sessions? Well, thank you. It's good to have all of you here. The um, process is m more rigorous, as you know, 
than just uh, the hearing the hearing we have today. Each of you had to be interviewed by the Department of Justice and, I, and perhaps the President of the White House. You've been uh, has to submit your materials. FBI has done backgrounds. ABA has done evaluations. Uh, you've submitted documents, according to our questionnaire, to the Senate and our staffs have done their best to pour over them to make sure that things are in order. I have to say at this point, um, um, there's nothing happening bad, I guess for no. you would say. Uh, <laughs> it looks good uh, on your record, uh, and each of you have had a, a good deal of experience. Uh, it seemed to me to have the kind of skills and gifts and graces and background uh, that uh, would uh, put you in a position to do a good job as a United States District Judge. But it's not a little bitty matter that we go through. And I, um, this is a lifetime appointment. And um, it's the only opportunity the public has to have any kind of role in it. So I want to say even though we, we, we're we not going to be grilling you to, this morning or this afternoon, that um, uh, a lot of work has gone into assuring the public that your nominations are worthy of going forward, that you have the skills, the integrity, and uh, to do a good job. Um, uh, Mr. Gurgle, you you mentioned uh, the rule of law, um, and you practiced for some time. I just was reading an article in Fortune magazine by the CEO of a major company, and he was talking about their investment group, and they were investing all over the world, and he was talking positively about it. And the uh, interviewer said, well, why, what about the United States? Do you still believe in investment in the United States? Uh, in three different occasions in that protracted interview, he said yes, and the first reason he gave was the rule of law, that uh, you can invest in the United States, you can feel like you uh, have a, a fair day in court if something comes up, and you're at much greater risk in other countries, uh, many other countries, because they don't have that great tradition. And you experience, um, uh, how, how do you evaluate the importance of the rule of law? Well, Senator, um, I think that's an excellent question. I have a friend who was telling me a story about a colleague who had invested in Russia and had a dispute come up that was an ordinary business dispute. And the, uh, the disputant sent over thugs to threaten the American businessman, and he packed up and left Moscow and has never returned. It shows you you cannot have a free enterprise system. You cannot have a free market if you don't have the rule of law. It is essential to the rule of law. I just agree. And um and that's one of the reasons I feel so deeply is the rule of law is uh, you interpret the statutes and constitution as written. And uh, we give, you get awfully inconsistent verdict because each judge allows their empathy or their feelings or their philosophy to Im impact it. Judge Miller, uh, you've had experience with the sentencing guidelines. They are, you've expressed some concern about the um, tough sentences on occasion you've been in. Uh, uh, called upon to impose, I understand, in, in one con commencement speech, I, I understand. You're not the only judge that's expressed that. Um, and we just passed, uh, in a bipartisan way, unanimously out of the Senate, a modification of the crack and powder uh, sentencing guidelines, which are, I think, the primary source, would you not agree, of uh, some of the heavier sentences in the system. Uh, so I guess my question to you is, uh, you're about to have this lifetime appointment. Um, uh, how do you feel about the guidelines? What deference do you feel they should be given, and to what extent will you follow them? Senator, thank you for that question and the opportunity to clarify. I'm not certain I'm remembering the, the, the comments you're referencing. It might have come from an, my very first days as a judge. When I first became a magistrate judge, I had had no criminal experience. I think the quote was, why am I faced with placing children in jail longer than they've been alive? And sometimes uh, that is true. Um, then you said, of course, there is never a reasonable justification, but I'm still searching for explanations. Close quote. That's the I, I may be completely oh, forgetting. I, I, that doesn't sound I like anything I've ever said. I think no. you're correct. 
I don't think that was you. Okay. <laughs> Somebody else would have to answer for that, Judge Child. I, I have forgotten. <laughs> I have forgotten many things I've said. But I'm glad to know I wasn't wrong in that. I must say that, that when you were stating that, that words sounded quite familiar. <laughs> ah, ah. Well, it's a tough thing. Um, how do you feel that? about it? Uh, the duty that you have to impose sometimes very tough sentences. And will you do it? Absolutely, Senator. And let me just say, even though I do not currently see felony cases, I see felony defendants only on initial appearances, detention hearings, but I regularly consult the guidelines in resolving the Class A misdemeanor cases that are before me, even though I understand, following Booker and Fan Fan, that the guidelines are advisory. I, I regularly consult them in every case. I consider them an essential tool, uh, both to ensure that I make a well-informed decision in imposing judgment and sentence, but moreover in ensuring that I am complying with the statutory factors under 18 U.S. Code Section 3553, and in particular, the factor that focuses on uniformity, ensuring to the best possible that courts are imposing uniform sentences throughout the country. So I, I consider the guidelines a very valuable tool. I appreciate that. I think that's a good answer and for your new federal judges to be. Um, I think that's good advice. It would be my, a lot of time and effort went into uh, identifying what an appropriate sentence is, what are the aggravating, mitigating circumstances. It's a bit mechanical. Some judges don't like it for that reason. But when the dust settles, I think we've definitely achieved more uniformity, more consistency, and actually allow you to feel more comfortable that the sentence you've imposed um, is one that is not out of the mainstream. Of thinking. Mr. Gergo, would you uh, uh, share your thoughts about how you would approach the guidelines? You know, we in South Carolina have a special relationship with the guidelines because the chair of the Senate, originally sentencing commission was uh, Billy Wilkins, the chief judge of the Fourth Circuit. And I've had the privilege of having two lengthy discussions with Judge Wilkins since the president was kind enough to nominate me about both the philo underlying philosophy and the practical application. Um, of the guidelines, and I've also had uh, spent a good bit of time studying them. They show a lot of collected wisdom and experience. They are a very valuable tool. They should be the benchmark and the beginning point of every sentencing process. And I have found that looking at this is often where you end up because it is so reasonable. There are obviously circumstances where they don't fit. Often, all parties, the U.S. Uh, Attorney's Office and the um, defendant, um, council will recognize when they don't fit. They're usually, that's not a matter of dispute, but generally speaking, they are a very valuable tool, and I pledge to seriously consider them um, in any sentencing that I do. I would say that uh, Judge Wilkins' leadership in establishing the sentencing guidelines was probably the greatest change in the entire criminal justice system since the founding of the Republic. Uh, maybe the eliminating of parole, and you get definite sentences. But both of those happened about the same time. It was a bipartisan uh, act by this Senate before I got here. And uh, I think it has, has been helpful. Uh, Judge Childs? Yes, in state court, we obviously are not bound by any sentencing guidelines, as well as we don't really have sentencing guidelines as advisory. So in that regard, I do believe that the federal court guidelines and I appreciate the collaborative and bipartisan efforts that have gone into those guidelines. They assure more consistency, uniformity, and reasonableness of the sentences. As state court judges, we have a broad range, and that will uh, differ, differ from judge to judge as to what a particular sentence might be to an individual defendant. So I'm certainly ready, if uh, lucky enough to be confirmed as well, to approach those guidelines as advisory, but also have some well-reasoned explanations for departing from such guidelines. It might make you sleep a little better if uh, you're, just, you're following the recommendations of people who objectively figured out what they thought would be a reasonable sentence. Absolutely. Uh, judge Eagle. Yes. Uh, when I became a judge in 1993, we did not have any sentencing guidelines or anything like that in North Carolina. Very big disparities in sentencing across the state from judge to judge. But we did have... Uh, 
structured sentencing enacted in North Carolina in 1994. It's not exactly the same as the federal system, I understand, but it does have presumptive sentences with aggravating factors and mitigating factors. And I have been working with those since, um, I think it, if I can remember, it's October 1st, 1994, crimes committed after that date. So I'm used to working with guidelines. It, uh, it gives a framework for sentencing that is extremely helpful and useful, and I agree with uh, my colleagues that I would definitely consult those in the first instance. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Sessions. Um, I'm not going to ask any more questions, but uh, I, I am going to say this. Um, you're all uh, going to the federal trial court, and um, it's where the rubber hits the road, and it's where people come in and petition. It's where you will be dependent upon to settle cases because some of you will have very large caseloads. And so your ability to work a case to settlement rather than take it to trial is also all important. Um, we consider the federal court the best, the smartest, um, the premier court in the United States. And so there is a level of trust uh, that you take. Uh, the fact that this is a lifetime judge, a, ju a lifetime position, uh, that you can only be impeached, you don't have to run for office, is an enormous, I think, responsibility and that the faith and trust and obligation toward the law and the constitution of your country of our country is all important so I just want to say that I have no doubt but that you're going to be confirmed and I want to wish you well and I want you to carry that standard high uh, so with that 